never have lunch by yourself. Always meet with someone that may have nothing to do with your field of expertise or your field of pursuit, but you will learn something and they will learn something. And that knowledge is power over time because understand different perspectives and you see how that applies to your own life. Welcome to the Indianist podcast, a show about leaders of Indian origin who have overcome challenges and worked with dedication to ultimately achieve success. By telling the stories of the defining milestones in their journeys, we hope to inspire others to learn how they too can succeed in their pursuits. Here's your host, Sanjay Puri. Welcome to the Indian Nest podcast. So today we have someone like that and a very exciting conversation with Dr. Vivek Lal, who is a leader of one of the largest defense and nuclear energy companies. Vivek, welcome to the Indian Nest podcast. Thank you so much, Sanjay. It's a pleasure to have you here, Vivek. Since the podcast is about Indian Nest, we tend to go a little deeper beyond what's on LinkedIn or CV. So can you just take us back right from the beginning, where you were born and how your journey has gone through? That would be very helpful for us. I was actually born in Jakarta, Indonesia. My father was a diplomat, and my parents moved from country to country. So me and my sister, of course, followed them to the different countries as I was growing up. Stayed in Indonesia for a few years and moved to various other countries as I grew up, including my primary schooling in Vienna, Austria. And then I was in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania, in other parts of Europe. I came to Canada in 85, where I did my bachelor's in mechanical engineering at Carleton University. And then post that was in the U.S., in Florida and in Kansas to get my degrees in aerospace engineering and both master's and PhD. And then I also did an MBA in finance. So it has been a journey of staying in different countries, different locations. Along the way, I picked up five languages, and I forgot most of them as well, because if you don't use it, you lose it. But it has been an interesting journey, three years at a time, growing up in these different countries and cultures. But the one thing that it taught me is how to adjust in different cultures and circumstances and different education systems. So a large part of my education was in the British school system, and then later in the American system. So I saw various differences in that itself. Wow. Moving from different school systems, we were building new friends, again, changing languages. That must have been pretty tough because you have settled in with a certain clique or certain group of friends. How was that? As you said, it was difficult, but you did it. But how was it? Yeah, in retrospect, it's really benefited my life and career to have had those adjustments. They are difficult, especially this all happened in an era where we did not have the internet and the connectivity that we have today, where you can keep in touch with old friends and new ones across continents and countries. And so it was, those days were days of letter writing and keeping in touch and it poses challenges, but then it also makes one appreciate what technology has done since then and the ability of connecting. And indeed, once technology came to the forefront, I've been able to connect with a lot of people in these different countries that I've lost touch with over the years. So it has been both Difficult in certain cases, being the new kid in the new class in the new country in the new language, but also a real benefit because it molds your character to to adjust and to be empathetic to people's views and thoughts in different parts of the world and where they come from. That's a good point, being able to adjust and be empathetic to different viewpoints. So growing up, you were never in India, really. I did live in India for brief periods of time, but fundamentally grew up abroad. Wonderful. And you're talking about the pen pal days and how now technology has changed. Facebook, LinkedIn, as you said, allows people to really get connected to each other. And that's been a big change. But then 
talk to us a little bit about the journey that led you to where you are today. You don't see like too many, at least not too many Indian Americans who are running large defense or nuclear companies. So take us through that journey a little bit. You came, you got yourself educated, Canada and here. So how did you end up here? That's a great question. I've always had a passion for airplanes ever since I remember being a young boy age five or six. And at the time I was in Vienna, Austria, but I'd look up in the sky and be enamored and very surprised that such a massive airplane would actually stay in the air and fly. And so it was that passion and that drove me towards the kind of education that I sought. I did my bachelor's in mechanical engineering at the time when it was not very popular to do mechanical engineering. People had started to look at computer engineering and other more advanced types of engineering. But my passion was aeronautics, and most aeronautics areas were under the ambit of mechanical engineering departments. And so I started there, and the passion continued to grow, and therefore I did my master's in aeronautical. I also had the opportunity to train as a private pilot. And because again, without experiencing flight, it's very hard to be a designer and understand the engineering from a user's perspective. So that passion continued to grow. And that's why I continue to pursue degrees in my doctoral work, worked with NASA Ames Research Center in some of the things that I was doing in turbulence modeling at the time. And I stuck to it career-wise too whether Raytheon or Boeing or Lockheed, General Atomics, but that has been a common thread in my career. So the passion for what's up in the sky, the planes and aeronautics, which at that time, as you said, was not as popular under mechanical engineering. And then obviously you moved on to different companies and different parts of your career, but you also ended up in India with one of these companies. Vivek, how did that happen? Yeah, so that was at Boeing. I had this opportunity based on my mentor who suggested that India is a growing market. And because obviously being from Indian origin, this is an area of potential significant growth. This was in the early 2000s. I was actually in engineering at the time. I had no idea about or no plans to get into the sales and marketing pieces of this. But after that inspirational conversation, I thought it will be new learning. And so for a couple of years, I learned brand management, economics, and areas that I was not that familiar with. And as I mentioned, I did an MBA with a concentration in finance. And that all led me to being sent as an expat to India what was supposed to be a three-year assignment, I ended up staying there 11 years because there was such growth in commercial aircraft as well as defense aircraft and the whole space area was also opening up. So it was a really a growth time and U.S.-India relations were warming up post the civil nuclear agreement. And it was a great time to be on the ground floor of some of them putting in those seeds that have since then grown into a a flourishing relationship between the two countries. You're absolutely right. So how was it going from here? This is something I get always fascinated, having worked here and then spending time there. How was that experience for you? Yeah, initially, it was quite a change, living in Seattle and then moving to Delhi. And this was in the early 2000s. And with two young kids, who were born in Seattle and moved at the age of two and six months over there. So the circumstances, of course, very different. And it took maybe six months to a year to get adjusted to that system and that environment from multiple perspectives. But I think just the energy and the buzz around the fact that this is going to be an important relationship between U.S. and India and an important dimension of that relationship that kept us going. And certainly the family also started to enjoy it. We started enjoying it to the extent that a three-year assignment ended up being us living there for 11 years. So wow. 
it was quite a positive experience for us. And you indirectly referenced the U.S.-India relationship, and you played a key part in the defense aspect of that relationship. How has that changed? Because you, as I said, have played, a, in my opinion, a very instrumental part. If you go back to the time that you landed there in Delhi with Lockheed, and today when you look at it, how do you visualize that? I landed there with Boeing at the time. And, Sorry, Boeing. Um, the relationship has really grown, Sanjay, over the last two decades. Now there's over $21 billion of trade. There's a lot of mill to mill exercises. I think the largest number of mill to mill exercises occur between US and India now. There have been foundational agreements being put into place. The level of cooperation and trust has increased multiple fold. The strength that we started with was the people-to-people -people ties in the early 2000s, but that strength has been multiplied several fold with the fact that there has been a natural convergence of not only the people-to-people -people ties, but the business ties. The, I think of it in terms of six stakeholder buckets. It's the political spectrum, the bureaucratic spectrum, the academic spectrum, the industry spectrum the communications and media spectrum, and then finally, the end user of whatever cooperation you're trying to make. And if you look at all of those buckets of stakeholders that are involved in the relationship, it has grown multiple fold. So the six buckets are really doing well, and the trade, as you said, has grown. The relationship has, is now on a track, which no matter who is in power is going to continue to grow, Vivek, from your perspective. You had a tremendous journey. You worked with some of the biggest defense companies, Boeing, Lockheed, and now you are with General Atomics. But there have, must have been some, I wouldn't call them low points, but some challenges along the way. Can you just talk about them and how did you get through them? Was your Indianness or your having that ability to move from place to place, was that helpful? Can you just talk a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. I think the fact the bilateral relationship between any two countries or entities, they obviously go through its ups and downs. But the fact that there is an overarching resilience to make it work enables one to find solutions. So sometimes the English language and its use and its connotation for different countries mean different things. What I found in my journey is that a lot of these challenges that one can face in terms of getting people aligned, in terms of resolving conflict, is just a matter of education and a matter of persistently explaining different points of view. And that requires a lot of patience and perseverance. And that, of course, was came to me relatively naturally because of my upbringing and background where you do take the time to understand different cultures, different perspectives, even though both sides are speaking English, but they are coming at it with different thoughts in their mind. So to be able to iron out those differences when they do occur requires a lot of education. And the one common thread I've seen, no matter which countries I've dealt with, is the more time you spend in a patient way, the better the outcome, especially when you run into difficult circumstances. So patience and perseverance have been some of the things that have really helped you with a lot of the challenges that you have dealt with. And some of those were part of the upbringing that you had going from place to place or part of just overall upbringing that you had, Vivek, which is important for our listeners to understand and know. You are with General Atomics, which obviously is one of the leaders in unmanned. The defense industry has changed, moving more towards autonomy. What are your thoughts at a high level in terms of where you see the industry going for people who are following this? Yeah, I think you said it just right, Sanjay, autonomy and Unmanned is the way of the future, not only with defense applications, but commercial applications as well. But I do see deep tech, whether it is artificial intelligence, whether it's quantum computing, 
whether it is space, both commercial and defense. These are some of the areas that are going to define the future and not any of these in their isolation or vertical stack, but more as a multidisciplinary optimization issue that going forward. And so I think some of the solutions and some of the platforms and services that will evolve over time will actually take into and factor in all these pieces that we talk about. And so I think it's a very exciting time we live in. I think a lot of work is going on. A lot of investments are going on in these various areas and a lot of fundamental technology areas. Semiconductors, for example, that's also the backbone of a lot of what we are talking about. And to build resilient supply chains, we've seen in recent years how that has become such a significant issue. And so like-minded countries staying close together. We've seen the formation of things like the Quad and how they are working together in certain areas of technology and sustainability. But I do feel that these are some of the basic technology areas that will propel us in the next 5, 10, 15 years. That's a good thing to know. You talked about AI, cyber, quantum computing, sustainable supply chains, and obviously autonomy that is driving all of this, which is going to be the future. I think those are very good parts. Being Indian American, obviously, there is this sometimes the paradox where you have your Indianness at home and in an American environment outside. How do you balance and juggle it trying to keep that for both sides going? I think it's very important to bring the best of India to U.S. and the best of U.S. to India in that sense. I think there's, uh, like I said, because of the people-to-people ties and so forth, there's already, as part of mainstream, a lot of recognition of what Indian values, Indian culture, and so forth are in the U.S. And we share a lot of the same principles, the democratic principles of and the integrity we have in daily life and so forth. So I think there's a great convergence of thought in terms of how we live our life and give back and do good for the society. And to answer your question more directly, I think from both cultures, whether the American culture or Indian culture, there's a lot to learn on the positives. And, you know, in all our lives, we pick what makes most sense for us as we lead our lives. But I think the richness of both countries in terms of some of the things that work and work well gives us a unique advantage, I would say, as Indian Americans to leverage that for the betterment of not only our generation, but future generations too. Good point. Leveraging both cultures and benefiting from that for us and for the future generations. I think that's a very important point. You obviously have been at leadership roles in some of these companies. You are currently also in a leadership role. And you are basically still at the midpoint of your career. You're still, when I say midpoint in terms of age, you still have a long journey ahead of you. Where do you see from a professional standpoint, at least your journey going from here? Since given that we have a going to be having an 80-year-old president, you still have a long journey ahead of you. Well said, Sanjay. Yeah, you know, this journey that I, my life and career has taken has all been Unplanned. My every three to five years thing, countries have changed and certain languages have changed and being able to adjust to change is very important. But certainly my passion and looking into the future, I would say is dual prong. One is these technologies like unmanned and space and so forth is very close to my heart because of my education and my background. And that's where I think I can con- continue to contribute in aerospace and defense. And the second piece of it is as one enters, and you're very generous by saying the second half, but the later years, I think, is always a great opportunity to incubate and help the next generation of leaders and the next generation of thinkers in this, in my space of aerospace and defense and management. And so I have always maintained a very close relationship with academic institutions in my life. I've been an adjunct faculty from time to time, and I enjoy teaching. I enjoy 
being able to give back. And so I do see that as an increasing part of my forward career is whenever and wherever in whatever role I am, I'd like to spend time with the young upcoming generation. I've had the opportunity to speak at some convocations and you see the energy and the eagerness and the buzz and how smart the kids are these days compared to where I was at least. You really want to give back and give the benefit of your experiences and actually learn from them because one is set in one's ways based on what one has learned many years ago. A lot of the things I continue to learn from my kids, in fact. And so that interchange between those that are considered guiding light and those that are emerging into their careers in life, I think that distance is getting shorter and shorter. And I'd like to be part of that, of course, as my career continues. Those are very inspiring thoughts in terms of paying it forward, giving back. You talked about academics because, as you rightly said, there's so much energy and knowledge that is coming, and it's incredible the pace of change, what is going on. But what I gather is academics playing a role in defense space and working with the younger generations. I think they will be all very glad for some of your thoughts on this. We make, we do a lightning round of short questions. It depends, short is a relative term. So I'll just ask you a few questions to get your perspective. This podcast is called Indianness, and everybody has a different definition of that. We ask each of our guests, what is, we make your definition of Indianness? So Indianness, I think, is a way in which one conducts oneself in terms of one's background and culture and upbringing. Very proud of the Indian culture and the Indian upbringing that I've had. My parents were my mentors and best friends. I miss them every day of my life. And I think that is part of, I think, a very strong family value system we come from. Many of us from Indian origin and Indian upbringing. And so for me, that really defines everything else. That's what I'd call Indianness. Your background and upbringing and being proud of that. Thanks for that answer. Who is one person, Indian American or somebody of Indian origin, who is living that inspires you? Oh, that's a tough question. There are many, and I have 1.4 billion people to choose from. <laughs> so, How about giving a few? Because this is also a question we ask everybody. I would certainly start with my family. If my family was not as supportive and strong of what and allowed me right from my upbringing to now to do what I do, I would not be able to really contribute in the same way. In terms of iconic mentors, there are many in the different fields of science and technology and various areas, but I still would go back to and relate it to your first question, and I think it all starts with the family. Which would be your favorite job that you've had? You've had some very amazing positions, but is there a favorite job that you've had? I think my current position would be my favorite simply because I'm able to bring in business aspects, technology aspects, international aspects, global issues in science and technologies. I'm really very thankful for kind of the role that I have and where I can contribute and more importantly, continue to learn because as I went through my education process, it was very clear to me that the more degrees I got, the less I felt I knew because the more you get deeper into it, you realize, oh, I really don't know a lot. So that ability to learn is very important and I'm very happy with the ability to do that in my current role. Well, I think part of your success is also your humility. So, Vivek, what advice would you give your younger self that if you were, if you could go back in time, what would be the advice, let's say 20 years ago or 30 years ago when you were starting your career? What advice would that would be valid for you? I think, and I got this advice later when I started in some of my jobs, but I think networking is sometimes underplayed. And I think the earlier one starts in one's career or one's academic career even, 
the better it is because you connect with more people. You connect with people that have nothing to do with what you're doing, even in terms of fields. But it just increases your knowledge, increases your network. And so networking, I would say, is probably one key learning that you can't you know, overestimate. This is something that you definitely need all your life. And it results in not necessarily knowing a lot of people, but it results in you enriching your knowledge and your base of perspectives. And so I think that is what I'd point to. So you mean, as a lot of people say, it's important that what you know, but it's also important who you know. But what you're saying is it really helps you from a knowledge perspective for reaching out to multiple people in different fields. Is that what you're saying, Vivek? Yes, exactly. One of my early mentors told me that never have lunch by yourself. Always meet with someone that may have nothing to do with your field of expertise or your field of pursuit, but you will learn something and they will learn something. And that knowledge is power over time because understand different perspectives and you see how that applies to your own life. Never have lunch by yourself. That's a very good thing because I was going to have lunch. Maybe I need to call somebody up because it's about after this, it'll be lunchtime. But that's a very good point. Never have lunch by yourself. Bigger thing is take make every opportunity to reach out and meet different people. You know, that's very good to know, Vivek. Thank you so much for taking the time. Thank you for your insights to providing folks who are truly inspired by your journey to follow up. So thank you for being on the show. It's an honor and privilege to be with you, Sanjay. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Indianist podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please leave a five-star review and subscribe to enjoy future inspirational stories. 